Amen. Gonna hasten to our time of preaching and teaching this morning. The, the scriptures are gonna come from St. John, the 13th, I'm sorry, the 20th chapter. Amen. Uh, St. John, chapter number 20, is where we'll spend our time this morning. Uh, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, we are constantly reminded of the powerful nature and, and cause of, of God's activity made possible through the power of God's spirit. And, um, you know, as I was pulling my final thoughts together for today, I was just reflecting on how the message of Easter, the message of resurrection uh, for some of us, how many have been in church, you would say most of your life, most of your life. All right. Look at look at half of those hands that didn't go up. Clap your hands for half the hands that haven't gone up. This is why we come to church. Amen. On Easter. And every day is because we are trying to make uh, familiar the, the story and the teachings of this uh, radical faith. I want you to be mindful for many of us who have heard this uh, story so many times before it loses its radicality. Amen. We kind of just take it for granted because we've heard it. How many of you ever heard a story so many times that, okay, it, it's kind of like uh, the Cosby show growing up or Martin or, or, or Living Single. Any, any fans that you want? Y'all like, no, I don't watch them shows. I don't know what show. Okay. Uh, uh, Star Wars. Any Star Wars? You know, no Star Wars. Man, what y'all be watching? Praise God. <laughs> My, my, my mind is going, Voltron, GoBots, Transformers. All right, come on, come on, I hear, I hear, amen. I, Transformers, I got an amen from somebody. <laughs> the, 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 the thought, though, goes that, you know, sometimes familiarity with a story often causes it to lose its, its impact and its punch. The first time you heard a story and it was so beyond your kind of comprehension. Uh, anyone ever left a movie just just shaking your head like, I cannot believe what I just saw. I cannot believe what I just heard. I can't believe what I just experienced. Your whole body releases all these, these stimulants and, and, and chemicals that, that give you a high sometimes. It makes you have this, this moment where you will never forget it. And sometimes I think as we go through the seasons of Christmas or Easter or these other kind of high points in the Christian calendar, we, we are often left uh, kind of engaging in this season of worship more as a routine or an obligation. But I want you to know that there is so much that rides on us really internalizing the radical claims of what these high points in our Christian faith point to. Because for many of us, uh, we are constantly trying to make sense of the foolishness of this age, right? The, the inconsistencies, last week we talked about the, 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 the dissonance, right? The, the, those things that are at work in our minds and in our hearts that, that just don't often add up to what you expected was going to happen. Anyone ever had a curveball thrown at you and it just totally, radically destabilized your sense of equilibrium, right? And it is in these moments that I find such claims of our faith to be an opportunity for us to be grounded once again in the God of history that is never surprised, but always open to surprising us. Uh, do I have anybody that's willing to be surprised today, man? Like, God, I, 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 I'm willing to, to create some space in my life for you to surprise me. Even when you give me a promise, the promise can sometimes be so beyond my ability to comprehend it. That when I get the promise that you've given to me, I still am surprised. Anybody ever had that kind of experience, right? Amen. I, I, I grew up, you know, uh, in, in our family, we, we had uh, six kids and my parents would, uh, before Christmas, they would, they would give us uh, a magazine to, to pick uh, our, 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 our Christmas presents out of. And we would all get three uh, choices under $30. That's what happened when you have four or five kids to get one present at a time. Somebody say amen, right? 
And, 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 and even though we kind of had a sense of what the gift would look like, we chose our gifts and they chose what they would give us. And even though we knew what we chose uh, on Christmas morning, it was a huge surprise. <laughs> To the point where, you know, you could barely sleep at night. You're, you, 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 you're waking up early, even though you kind of know that, you know, I know what to expect, but I'm, I'm still open to the surprise. Well, I want you to sit through and during this season of resurrection with that same posture and possibility. That, God, I know what you've promised, but I am open to still being surprised. John chapter number 20, verse number one, uh, the scriptures uh, come to us. This is the gospel according to John. It is his account of his encounter with Jesus and his encounter with the life and the ministry of Jesus. And we're going to pick it up uh, right after the, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. Jesus has been killed by the state, by the empire, by uh, the government of his day uh, for uh, being too disruptive, for uh, pushing back against the norms of their uh, sensibilities, their cultures, their laws. And, and Jesus ends up on a cross, he's dead and he's buried in a tomb. And we are about two and a half to three days later, it is thought. And so on the first day of the week, the scripture says, while it was still dark, somebody said it was still dark outside. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Mm. And then Peter and the other disciples set up and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Amen. I mean, John, he had a, he, 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 he was uh, Usain Bolt in this story. Praise God. Amen. They, they start at the same time, but they end up at the same destination at different times. That's a revelation all in and of itself. Praise God. But we, 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 we not going to mess with you this early. Amen. Uh, John bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following John and went into the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Verse number eight, then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. Somebody say he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead then the disciples returned to their homes but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb as she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying one at the head and the other at the feet and the angel said to Mary woman why are you weeping she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When all, when she had said this, she turned around, saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing Jesus to be the gardener, Mary said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Now, I want you to just appreciate how radical this whole encounter is. First of all, uh, you know, it is not common for women during this day to be engaging so frequently with men in particular, but particularly dead men. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. In, in, the, in, the, in the ritual and tradition of this time, uh, if you were a deceased individual, you were only supposed to be handled by the same gender of the person who has been deceased. And so I want you to appreciate that in every story we encounter about Jesus' resurrection morning, it is the women who seem to show up first. It is the women who seem to push through the kind of traditional uh, obstructions 
to get to Jesus, which often helps, I think, all of us to appreciate that most of the time, people who are a little more marginalized in society, people who have a little bit more to lose, people who are not always flowing in the mainstream are often more open to experiencing and pushing beyond the comfort zones. How many know sometimes when you have a lot to lose, you're willing to risk a lot? But when you have a lot of privilege, a lot of wealth, a lot of insulation, amen, you know, I've talked to a number of folks and be like, you know, Pastor Mike, that all sounds great, but you know, I got a lot to lose. <laughs> Praise God. Took me a long time to get this degree now. I'm not a trying to, took me a long time to get this promotion. Amen. Do you know how long I worked to get these red bottoms? I'm not going to be out here, you know, scuffing them up. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out with some, some fellas out here. They, they got a whole sneaker uh, culture. Praise God. Folk out here and, 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 they, and they spend hundreds of dollars on one pair of shoes. Praise God. And it's a fascinating thing what they are willing and not willing to do in them shoes. Amen. Amen. I'd be like, I hope somebody who you love, amen, ain't catching a, 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 a real hard time with your shoes on. You know, let me take off my shoes before I try to save your life. Praise God. Uh, nevertheless, Jesus identifies himself to Mary. Why? Because she happened to be there. She happened to be willing to be in a place where she could be surprised. Now, I need you to appreciate, child of God, she did not know a surprise was coming. She thought she was coming to do what she believed to be her duty. But in the course of being faithful to her duty, God gave her an experience she would never forget. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, that in this moment and in this season, as we are trying to figure out how we should live in light of all that has happened to us, that we are being invited, even through our duty and obligation, to return to God. To return to God with a vibrancy and an openness to be surprised. Bow your heads with me and let's just say a quick word of prayer. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. amen. Somebody holler, I'm ready to return. I'm ready to return. So key takeaways, that I just want to lift up real, real quick from this passage. Some of our greatest revelations will happen in the dark. And we find that in this story. How? Because uh, Mary shows up to the tomb, the scripture says, while it was still dark. How many of you have ever had moments in your life where you uh, are moving and bumping around without a lot of light or with a lot of gloom hanging over you? And it is in those moments that you experience a revelation. You experience some knowledge. You have uh, some kind of an encounter that actually becomes a pivot point for the rest of your life. Sometimes your greatest revelation will happen in the dark. Another thing that comes uh, out of this, I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again, that people who are living in the margins often have a better view of the thing that is to happen before folks who are operating in the mainstream. And that often makes sense. Because if you're in the, on the margin, how many know you can see things coming before people who are literally in the mainstream? Uh, verse number two gives us another revelation that your interpretation of a miracle may not always be accurate at first glimpse. I'm going to unpack that in a few more moments. I want you to hold on to that. Another thing that is so interesting about this passage is that there, are good, there is good news and there is bad news. And bad news seems to travel faster than good news. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced that. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 but the scripture says my foot almost slipped. Amen. And it's like, man, I was still slipping and the news had already spread across town. 
Or, or the last thing that I, I, I want to pull out just for the purposes of a highlight is that people don't always arrive at the destination at the same time, nor do they emerge with the same belief from the same experience at the same time. All of this hopefully adds up to teach us a couple of things that I find to be so apropos about this moment in the season of resurrection because every say 30 to 40 years uh, the, the, the religious calendars of the Abrahamic religions, uh, Jew, uh, uh, Judaism and Islam and Christianity, they all converge on the same weekend. So, 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 so you have Ramadan and you have uh, Passover and you have Resurrection Sunday or Easter all being celebrated in different parts of the world and in this city and in this country, in this region, all at the same time. Which leads me to believe that there are moments in our lives where the things that actually divide us can also be an occasion for us to imagine the way we actually hold some things in common. That the religious sensibility that comes from this idea of Father Abraham had many sons. Yeah, yeah, any, any Sunday school people have been here? Not a lot. And many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left. Come on, come on, come on, somebody. Amen, amen. <laughs> That, that for many of us, we are all emerging out of a stream of this experience with God. But as we emerge out of this stream of experience with God, it's important for you to appreciate that God has a unique experience through the life and the, the, the ministry and the death of Jesus Christ that should whisper something in your ear that ought to, to land in your heart in a very powerful way. And that message is simple, that death does not have the final say. That, that, that even though we may share a whole lot across our experiences, we have this commitment and this belief that come hell or high water, as a follower of the resurrected Christ, I can have confidence that death does not have the final say. And I'm not just talking about physical death, although in this story and in our experience, it is quite a wonderful promise. I mean, in another lectionary passage, the Apostle Paul says that you and I, if our hope is only for this life, we should be pitied among everyone. Why does he say that? Because the Apostle Paul realizes that for many who choose to follow the ways of Jesus, this life can be a hard journey. It can be hard to forgive folk who constantly take advantage of you. Somebody say amen. But if you're following Jesus, you're going to have to figure that thing out. It can be hard to live nonviolently in a world of violence and war. Somebody say amen. But if you're following Jesus, you're going to have to figure that out. It can be hard to give all your money to the poor and come and follow Jesus. <laughs> so y'all like, yes, it is, pastor. Don't be talking too much to me about that. Unless I'm the poor and you giving your money to me. Somebody say amen, right? But if we're following Jesus, how many of you know we're going to have to try to figure that thing out? It can be hard to love your enemies. I was talking to a, I was talking to a comrade of mine, and, and, and they said, the only reason I don't follow Jesus is because I have integrity. And I'm not going to love my enemies like Jesus tell me to. So I'm, I'm going to be another religion that don't ask me to do that. True conversation. Right? That some of us, we have lost the scandalous claims of what the Gospels are asking of us. But I want you to know, child of God, that there is some power in you and I returning to the way of the Lord. There's some power. There's some impact. There's some things at stake if you and I were to take this thing so seriously. But as we return, I want to ask you two quick questions. What are we returning to? I mean, the, the, the climate that many of us uh, are returning to God under, in, and through is a very different climate than 2020. 
I will suggest that if you, you know, since we haven't been in church for two years, y'all ain't been with God. I've been with God. We all been with God. We've been working out our faith. We've been virtually doing it. We've been doing it. Some of us in isolation. Some of us with small groups. Some of us, you know, a little stop and go. Some of us had some hard trials. They're 2020 and 21. And we was like, God, I, I need a little break. Amen. Because I, I can't figure this stuff out. Some of us are trying to figure out, God, is am I going to really do this again with you? But I want you to know it's worth taking stock about the conditions, the external conditions. What has changed since the last time you found yourself in relationship with God? I mean, COVID has been a radical shift. I mean, even as I look across, amen, the congregation and I see in about 95% of y'all with a mask on, thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen, COVID has taken a chunk out of our lives. There are folk who are no longer literally with us because of COVID. There are some of us who survived this, this, this pandemic and, and our breathing is literally not the same. Our, our, our strength is literally not the same. Our, our memory is literally not the same. Our families, our relationships, our ec economic condition is literally not the same. That the conditions have changed. And then we look at all the injustice that still pervades in the world. And we're dealing with one pandemic and, and having to deal with the ongoing pandemics. We have a war that's happening overseas and, and we have many smaller skirmishes happening all across the world where people are openly talking about nuclear weapons. How many know that wasn't happening before COVID, praise God? Folk had a little more sense than to openly talk about nuclear war, dare I say, annihilation. The conditions have changed. And yet, in light of these conditions, I still hear God declaring through the resurrection season that there's a return, that we're being invited to lean into. So what are, it's not only what are you returning to, but it's also what are you returning as? Because in light of all of these changes, how many of you know you can't stay the same? Now, some of us are a little bit more in denial than others about how change happens in your life. Some of us think that, you know, I'm just going to, this is just who I am. <laughs> and I'm not changing. I, I, I've been this way my whole life. I've liked what I've liked. I've hated what I've hated. And I'm just a fixed being in a world of cataclysmic and shocking change. That's some of our, some of us, that's our confession. You know, ever met someone who has been so self-deluded, praise God, that they just think that change does not penetrate their very penetrable being. But I want you to realize, child of God, that often death is a result of your changing. That there can be so much pressure put on your penetrable being that your being literally collapses under the weight of your penetrability. And to you who will not be open to change, you may be hastening your own demise. And so I ask you, child of God, if the world has changed and we are returning to God, how are we reflecting on the internal changes that God is inviting you and I to be conscious of? Because there's nothing worse than a person not conscious of their own change. There's nothing worse than someone who is not aware that, you know, you think you're the same, but you're really not. I don't mean to shame nobody. I'm just going to talk about myself. Praise God. But, you know, uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, when I was uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I, I, I was I was a little, little you know, I, I, I wasn't uh, I didn't carry so, so many pounds. Praise God. I was a lot more athletic. I used to, you know, play basketball. I was a little quick. You know, uh, somebody, you know, I was telling them that there's like you. <laughs> I said, yes, man. 
And I, you know, I had a little baby hook like Magic. Magic Johnson was my favorite player, so you know, uh, I used to always play that that clip when he was riding through the lane in the 1980, 88, 89 NBA Finals against the Boston Celtics. I think it was Game Five with 10 seconds left, and he got the ball and he stuttered and he rolled through the lane, baby hook to win the game against the Celtics. I perfected that move. <laughs> I did fourth, fifth, sixth grade. <laughs> You can see young Mike. Touch your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. And what's so fascinating is that in my mind, I had always viewed that that was who I was when I would get out there on the court. You know, I still think, you know, I was, you know, ha. And, and I found that the longer I lived, my move didn't like work the same. Where I used to outrun folk, they stayed with me. Where I used to outjump folk, they hung with me. All of a sudden, one day I was walking past a, you know, a, 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 a window of a, a, on the street, and I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh snap. I'm not the same. It was a revelation to me. It was a painful one. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, you know, body shame nobody. I'm just trying to talk a little bit about how my own journey snuck up on me because I did not have a consciousness about how I had changed. And my conditions created lots of hints to me that I had changed, but I was not willing to be honest with myself about the change until I kept losing on my shot. <laughs> Child of God, you know, sometimes resurrection is about you and I acknowledging that change is not a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. It's a continuous thing. The question is, are you aware of the change and are you open to the returning of God's activity while you're changing? So there's three things I wanna say, then we're gonna be done for today. The first thing that I think the scripture lifts up for you and I, if we are going to embrace this season, this opportunity of return, is that we must return to God with a sense of wonder. Return to wonder. Some of us, I believe, are kind of like the disciples in this story where God has promised and God has prepared and God has forewarned. God's given us little glimpses and hints, but because our mindset is so rigid and narrow, we have literally sucked wonder out of your life. And you believe, we believe, that our lives are fixed and they are dependent on your own strength, your own ability. But how many of you can be honest and say, there have been moments and seasons in my life where my strength did not get me over that hump? where I needed something that I still to this day cannot fully describe, but I know that it had to be something greater than myself. You see, one of the great challenges of a follower of Jesus or a human being, dare I say, who has lost wonder is that it shrinks your imagination about what is possible. It causes you to literally look at a miracle and see a crime. Because that's what's happened in this story. They literally, Mary shows up to the tomb and, 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 and instead of seeing the stone rolled away and instead of seeing Jesus being not present, she believes that Jesus has been kidnapped. She believes that someone is a tomb raider, a grave robber. She says not that a miracle has happened. She says a crime has been committed. 
And I want you to know, child of God, that some of us have that same mentality. We look at empty tombs and we don't see miracles. We see crimes. We see violations. We see things and occasions that rob us of the ability to have an expanded imagination about what could be. But I'm here to tell you, child of God, God wants to open up somebody's eyes to wonder again. God wants somebody's mind to wonder again. God wants you to appreciate that even though you may find a tomb present, there's also a miracle percolating not too far away. Oh, you ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm looking for a miracle. Amen. The Clark sisters used to sing that song a little while ago. It says, I expect the impossible. I wonder what would it look like this week if you said to yourself, I'm going to walk through my week and I'm going to be looking for a miracle. I'm not going to be content about the fixed situations at my school or on my job or in my neighborhood or in my body. But I believe that when I return to God, God begins to plant the possibility of a miracle in my life. I believe that God can do something that I could not imagine could be done. I believe that God can open a door that no one can shut. I believe that God can restore what everyone said was lost. I believe that God can heal what the doctors have called terminal. I want you to know, child of God, we come from a people who have have never lost the power to wonder uh, they told you what you would not be uh, but somehow God says you can be and do all things uh, they told you where you could not go uh, but God said I will lay plant a table right in the presence of your enemies uh, they told you how you would never win uh, but God says you are more than a conqueror Lord, help me to preach something in here today. Somebody say, be open to some wonder. And that's why I like that wonder is often not just emerging from the person in isolation. But in the text, it is clear that sometimes you need somebody else to give you a little tip about what God is up to. Mary, she thinks that uh, Jesus has been stolen. But angels show up. Somebody holler, thank God for the angels. Uh huh. The gardener shows up. Somebody holler, thank God for the gardeners. Uh, and even though the gardener was Jesus, she didn't know it yet. Uh, which meant that encounters show up that you're not even fully aware of. Somebody holler, thank God for the encounters. Uh, so I got angels, and I got gardeners, and I got mentors, uh, and I got encounters. Uh, why do they show up? Because God is trying uh, to unlock the mind uh, that has been locked up because of pain and struggle. God is trying to unlock the mind that has been locked up because of your own limited imagination. But I believe that the more God shows up, I believe that the more God reveals, I believe that the more God shows you, you won't need nobody to tell you anything because you can look back over your life and say if it had not been for the Lord on my side, if it had not been for the healer of my body, if it had not been for the deliverer of my soul, if it had not been for the way maker, for the healer, for the mind regulator, if it had not been for God on my side, I would not have won this fight. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, the second thing uh, is that sometimes you gotta be willing to lean into grief. Uh, the kind of grief that causes you to ask questions. Uh, Mary, she shows up to the tomb uh, and she confronts her worst fears. Uh, how many know sometimes when you're showing up uh, to a time and a moment of return, uh, you may have to confront some of your worst questions. Uh, I believe that sometimes uh, when you're coming back to God, you won't get all the answers on the first try, on the first question, on the first experience. Mary realized that Jesus was not there. She didn't get the whole revelation at the beginning of her encounter. But she says, I'm going to keep pressing in. The disciples ran back 
to the crib. They said, hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know what's going on, but I'm amazed. But the sister said, I got to stay here for a little while. I got to ask some questions. I got to shed some tears. What am I trying to say? As we've come through COVID, as we've come through the injustices, as you've come through the life transitions, don't you dare run away from God, but stay right here. Keep asking God some questions, even through your tears. Ask God, God, what are you up to? Even through your pain. Ask God, God, what are you up to? Even through your questions. Ask God, God, what are you up to? Because it's in your questions that you get to believe a new thing about God. Anybody ask God a question before? A question that you didn't have the answer to. But the longer you walk with God, you didn't have to ask that question again. When God healed your body, you didn't have to ask, is he a healer? When God brought you out, you didn't have to ask, is he a deliverer? But God did it over and over and over again. And the final thing I'll say is that the return always unlocks renewed faith somebody say renewed faith say it again renewed faith this means that faith is always present even when it is dormant the reason why I believe Mary shows up is because there was a seed of faith in her the reason why the disciples ran to meet the tomb is because there was a seed of faith planted there. It was planted by the voice of Jesus that told them that even though I'm going to die, three days later I'm going to rise again. God tells us things that often we cannot fully ascertain. But when God speaks, God plants it in our heart. And even though life may bury that seed, even though dissonance may confuse your consciousness of that seed, I want you to hear me on this. God's seed is never defeated by your doubt. God's promise is never frustrated by your unbelief. God's purpose is never disrupted by the external conditions. All God does from time to time is use our experiences to water the seeds, to cultivate the seeds, to remind us just like in this story that death has been defeated by the power, the wonder of the living God. Stand with me, everyone. And take a moment to remind yourself that we have won the victory through the power of God's spirit. Close your eyes and take a moment to preach to yourself. I've tried to preach to you today, but I want you now to preach to yourself. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself and just declare that death could not hold you down because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is literally raising you from your dead places. There are many resurrections happening in your life. And when I say many, I mean M-I-N-I. -I. Many small resurrections that are happening over the course of your life. And when you add up all of the small resurrections, 
they become a resurrected life. God is resurrecting your mind. God is resurrecting your spirit. God is resurrecting your purpose. God is resurrecting your family, your children, your relationships, your vocation. God is resurrecting so many things and added all together, they become a resurrected life. I want you to be open to the resurrected life that you are journeying into. Hallelujah. You have won a victory. It's all right to lift your hands just for a few moments. Come on, everybody. Hallelujah. You've won it just for me. You have won it all for me. Death could not hold us. Death could not hold you down. Yes, yes, yes. You are the risen King. Seated in majesty. Seated in majesty. Oh, you are. You are the risen King. Say it again. Death could not hold. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen king. Seated in majesty, yeah. And you seated in majesty. Yes, you are the risen king. So on this resurrection day, God, I pray that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, may it spark resurrections in our lives, in our consciousness. May we be aware, oh God, that you have brought us back from dead places and dead spaces and dead things. And we are living as resurrected people. You meet us in the course of our lives and you walk with us. You blow, you breathe life. So God, I pray for my brother, my sister, my loved one, today, God, who is struggling to see life in the midst of death, to see opportunity in the midst, hallelujah, of loss, to see you in the midst of change and struggle. I pray, God, that just like you sent an angel to Mary, I pray that you will send a messenger, just like you gave an encounter with Mary, I pray that you will unleash an encounter. But whatever is needed, oh God, to recapture the wonder, to process through the grief, but to also renew our faith, I pray, God, that our return will be indicative of all of these things. Save us. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Heal us. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Transform us. Somebody say, transform me, Lord. Do it in the name of Jesus and unleash our lives, Lord God, to be in the service of the resurrected King, the resurrected Savior. And may God, you have your way in our lives in Jesus name. We pray if you believe that the return is imminent, God is showing up in your life. Come on, clap your hands and let's thank God. Let's thank God. Let's thank God. Death could not hold.